Uh, so Dr. Uh, Yoni Wito has worked on PXC longer than uh, any active researcher. Uh, he's brought profound insight into our search for the first gene and more recently into treatments for PXC. Yoni has provided tremendous support for people with PXC and we are proud to uh, have supported his work for over 20 years. Uh, so Yoni, if you want to get started and uh, you take it away. Very good. Thank you, Sam. And um, good uh, evening, everybody. Or I guess it depends where you are. Um, uh, Sam is on the West Coast, so good afternoon. I think the uh, Europeans are ready to go to sleep and Japanese are just getting up. So, but here in Philadelphia, um, uh, good evening. Um, welcome to Jefferson uh, to this um, webinar. Uh, Jefferson is the home of the PX International Center of Excellence in Research and Clinical Care, uh, uh, which was established uh, in collaboration and in support uh, from PX International in 2016. And in addition to myself, we have uh, Dr. Slee and Van de Wethering uh, working um, as principal investigators, and we have a Hungarian visiting scientist, Dr. Flora Zeri, um, now the second year with us. Uh, so we've been very busy, and of course, we are collaborating very closely with Sharon Terry and the PX International, the entire community. So um, uh, uh, looking forward to uh, presenting some of our recent data here. Um, and let's see if I get somehow this. Uh, okay, this is uh, some of the areas of research that, on PXC that is going on right now here at uh, PX International Center of Excellence. Uh, so we are basically uh, trying to sort out the genetic basis, the molecular basis of PXC, looking specifically uh, uh, into modifier genes, uh, and I'll explain that uh, shortly. And then we are trying to look into mechanisms by which the uh, mutations, the, uh, the faults in the DNA and in the genes actually cause the calcification. And then importantly, we are looking into treatment options. How can we prevent the mineralization that is really the hallmark of PXC in the skin, eyes, and the vasculature. And an important question that is often asked, how can we reverse the existing mineral deposits? In other words, uh, when uh, the patients are uh, diagnosed with PXC, they already have this extra mineral deposit. So how can we get rid of it and maybe alleviate the, the disease? Uh, so, um, but today I'm specifically talking about the genetics of uh, PXC, but I will talk about some of the recent treatment developments at the um, you know, preclinical and early clinical level. So this is genetics of PXC and it's really work by uh, uh, Lily uh, Lee, who is uh, working with me here in the Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous uh, Biology at uh, Jefferson. Um, now, as Sam said, I've been working on PXC pretty long time. Uh, in fact, my first paper on PXC was in 1971. That's uh, probably much before some of you were born. Um, but we have make, made quite a lot of progress since 1971. And specifically, uh, I became seriously uh, involved in PXC research in uh, 1995, when Sharon Terry and Pat Terry came to my office uh, and they said, uh, Dr. Yu, can you help us? Our two children, Elizabeth, who is here, and Ian, uh, were di just diagnosed with PXC. And Sharon and Pat went to the uh, uh, textbooks and there was nothing known about PXC, absolutely nothing known what is causing it. It was not clear what the inheritance is, how severe the disease can be, et cetera. So I was a little glib at that time, said, um, well, uh, yes, I can help. We can clone the gene. And uh, so Sharon asked, uh, what do you need? Um, I said, we need 400 families, get their blood samples so we can identify the DNA and find the genes. And 
uh, uh, Sharon and Pat just uh, thanked and left, and we were thought they're never going to come back. Uh, uh, never going to come back because it's so rare disease. So, so anyway, uh, to make the long story short, uh, they um, uh, went and established the PX International, identified all the 4,000 families eventually in the United States, and they came back to my lab and said, here are DNA samples from 400 families. Uh, and can you, uh, Sam, uh, this is somehow moving. Yes, thank you. So uh, we started to work as a collaboration with the other laboratories and very uh, quickly we found the mutations in a gene called ABCC6, which was quite um, unexpected finding. But turns out that this is the major gene harboring mutations in, uh, in uh, different families in uh, e with the PXC, and as I will be telling you, about 90% of the families have mutations in this uh, uh, gene. And there are now um, uh, well over 600 different kinds of mutations in this ABC6 genes, different kinds of mutations. But here are sort of examples of the first 100 mutations that we were able to identify. And this shows here is the entire uh, the ABC6 gene has 31 separate exons or coding segments, and you have so-called nonsense mutations. So it's not nonsense as, as we are, uh, usually understand, but it means that the translation, the uh, synthesis of the protein stops prematurely, it stops where these arrows are. So you don't get a full length functional protein and therefore um, you know, these are defective uh, in that particular uh, uh, protein. The other kind of mutations, so-called missense mutations, and what that basically means that you have mutations, but you still make the full length protein, but you just change one single amino acid uh, among those 1,500 amino acid starts that are uh, put together and make this ABC6 protein. And you see there are clusters in certain parts of this protein which are important for the function of uh, this protein, which we quite don't uh, understand what it exactly does, but we have at this point very good uh, clues. So, when we identified the mutations, so what do you do? Uh, what do you use those information for? One way to look is inheritance pattern in families. So uh, there are autosomal dominant inheritance where you just inherit one copy from either mother or from the mother and you get the disease. Or it's so-called autosomal recessive where you have to get one copy, which is defective, mutant, from the mother, and one copy from the father. And so you, all these affected have two copies of the bad gene. Now, this is from the first paper that we uh, initially published, uh, the PXC mutations in ABC6 gene. And uh, here, these three families, family one, three, and um, you know, four, you know that they are clearly autosomal recessive uh, disease. Uh, so the parents are clinically normal. They each carry just one copy of the uh, uh, mutant gene, but all these unfortunate children caught both bad copies from the father and they got PXC. So these are clearly autosomal recessive. But how about then this family too? He was a mother and daughter who clearly had uh, uh, PXC. And um, uh, before we knew of the mutation, they were told that it's an autosomal dominant PXC. So uh, this daughter has inherited one packet copy from the mother and therefore they both have the disease. And the clinical implication is that the um, uh, uh, chance of uh, this daughter having affected children in one in two so 50% of the children uh, on the average are going to have a PXC. 
Now, however, when we now look for the mutations, we found that this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, here uh, daughter has two mutations. And one is coming from the mother and the other one from the father. So therefore, this is recessive disease in so-called pseudo-dominant inheritance pattern. But this basically means that her chance, instead of having one in two affected children, now it's something of the order is one in 5,000. Um, so the risk is completely different. So that's one of the advantages um, we were able to find from this mutation uh, detection uh, in, in the ABC6 gene. Now, one of the features uh, of PXC is that there's very uh, much what is known as phenotypic heterogeneity. In other words, people have different severity of the disease, even if they have the same uh, mutations in the same family, the severity can be very different. And um, it can be show up at the age of onset. Usually uh, PXC is relatively late onset, so it's not usually present at birth. The average age of onset is about 13 years of age, but there are patients who were not diagnosed before they were about 20s or 30s. And then there are these cases, uh, uh, pediatric PXC, where I've been um, uh, diagnosed as early as uh, two years of age. And next slide uh, shows uh, um, actually what our hypothesis in this study that I'm going to discuss is that there are genetic modifiers so they all have this ABC6 gene mutations, but then there are other genes that have mutations and they modify uh, the severity of the disease, including the uh, uh, age of onset and diagnosis of the disease. So here is, for example, one um, example of those pediatric PXC patients, a two-year-old female patient. Uh, the parents noted something in the skin, on the neck, and uh, went to see a dermatologist, and dermatologist uh, found these kind of little yellowish areas, uh, very characteristic of early PXC. And if you do biopsy and stain skin with a special stain, so-called von Cossa stain, there is these black areas that represent calcium. So there is already early calcification at the age of uh, two years noticeable in this uh, patient's skin. However, when uh, they did uh, these pediatric, um, uh, pediatricians did the more careful analysis and testing of this patient, they found that she also had blood vessels calcified at the age of two years. The arterial blood vessels, coronary artery, uh, was already mineralized at that age. And um, this is a very early finding in a special uh, subset of vascular mineralization disorder. We actually went and looked for the mutations. There were no mutations in ABCC6, but there was a specific homozygous mutations in another gene known as ENPP1, which is sort of metabolically related to the ABC6 in a subset of patients with vascular or tissue mineralization. And uh, this subset is called generalized arterial calcification of infancy, or we call it GACI, the Europeans call it GAGI, and uh, the, the Yale people call it gassy, uh, but it's basically autosomal recessive disorder. And the hallmark really is vascular, severe vascular mineralization, which in fact often is diagnosed by early um, uh, ultrasound, prenatal ultrasound at the 14th week of gestation. And they have blood vessels already uh, calcified, so they are born with uh, severe uh, uh, cardiovascular problems, and they often die within the first couple of months of life from uh, vascular uh, calcification consequences such as myocardial infarcts and uh, cardiac insufficiency. So, so in the spectrum of this cal uh, calcification disorders, there is PXE and GACI, 
and they both share the vascular mineralization, but the vascular mineralization is much more severe in these uh, GACI patients, and uh, they rarely have skin findings, um, uh, while PXC clearly has skin and eye findings associated with vascular mineralization. The PXC is late onset, the GACI is uh, diagnosed even pre and perinatal uh, stage uh, with ultrasound, and PXC patients largely have normal lifespan, uh, uh, while these GACI patients uh, uh, die usually within the first six months uh, uh, of life if they are not treated. So these were considered to be completely two different diseases before uh, the mutation analysis were made. We now know that there's an overlap in the phenotype and in the genetics, in that PXC is mostly caused by ABCC6 mutations, but also some of them have mutations in this ENPP1 gene, while the characteristic GACI is mostly caused by mutations in ENPP1, but some cases also have ABCC6. So there's uh, clearly this kind of crossover of the genetics and their clinical presentation. So going back to the PXC mutations in the ABC6 gene. So, so there are these um, mutation databases where you can actually find all existing mutations that have been identified uh, by investigators in different laboratories. And one of them is so-called human genome mutation database. And there are a 376 different uh, mutations. And these mutations have been verified by publication and they have carefully examined that they are true mutations. And then there's this ClinVar database. There are more mutations because not all of them are published. And in fact, some of the laboratories who are just identifying these mutations, they uh, can uh, download uh, by, from computer uh, these mutations. Uh, but there are certain types of, if you look now, for example, missense mutations, they're about 60 to 70 percent of all mutations. Nonsense mutations, those severe stop codon mutations, uh, about 10 percent, 6 percent, so it's a minor um, a fraction, and then there's different kind of uh, mutations. And the importance of this comes uh, evident shortly. Now, there are also recurrent mutations. The same mutation is found in different ancestral backgrounds. There is, for example, this uh, kind of mutation. It's a one amino acid changed to the top codon, termination codon. About 30% of the uh, mostly Caucasian patients have this mutation. And there is a, this mutation is the deletion, a big piece of the gene, exons 23 to 29, about 20%, mostly Northern Europeans have uh, uh, these mutations. So um, they, there are certain recurrent mutations, and there are also mutations which are found in certain populations in higher frequency. For example, South Africa, Afrikaner, they have this one specific missense mutation, arginine to lysine mutation, in about half of the patients. And it can be explained because there was a Dutch sailor in uh, 19, uh, 1500, actually 1500 something, sailed to South Africa and he had one of these genes and then was it propagated to the Afrikaner population in uh, South Africa. So it's one single founder mutation uh, there. But there are, for like, French Canadians have the 46% uh, uh, have uh, their own mutation. Italians have frequently this kind of mutation. Northern African French population, et cetera, have a kind of uh, own mutation. So there is this kind of ethnic ancestral uh, mutation database, um, which allows us then to, if somebody is from South Africa, you go directly and look for this mutation because chance finding is, is 50%. So again, uh, so why, why do we um, uh, do the mutation analysis and why all the PXC patients, and this is my um, uh, most important point today, all PXC patients should have their mutations uh, uh, known, tested for mutation, what kind of mutation they have. Now, what are the implications? So first of all, early on, 
when there's suspicion of PXE, you can confirm the diagnosis besides by skin biopsy, also by uh, mutation analysis. And then if you have those kind of large families, there are multiple affected individuals, there, that you have multiple carriers. So you can test those unaffected individuals, see if they are carriers, and then you can provide genetic counseling of their risk um, of having the uh, uh, similar kind of affected child, especially if they, in some uh, populations, they have tendency to uh, cons uh, consanguineous marriages. We've been working uh, on families from Iran 40% of the Iranian families are first cousin or second cousin marriages, but in some of the villages, um, the isolated villages, a uh, couple of hundred people, they all have the same last name, 90% of the marriages are uh, first or second cousin marriages, uh, so they are ha having a very high risk of uh, uh, autosomal recessive diseases, such as BX International, so we can do the carrier detection and then advise them of the risk of having an affected child. Also, very importantly, why we need to know the mutation is that there's new treatments coming uh, for heritable diseases. And they are allele specific, meaning that they are based on the specific kind of mutation. So you need to know the mutation and then there are ways to attack uh, or correct those specific uh, uh, mutations. Uh, and that is coming uh, within a couple of years. So you not need to know if you, uh, there are drugs coming which are able to read through the, those nonsense mutations. Now the drugs are coming, but you have to know that the patient has a, um, uh, that sort of mutation in order to apply this uh, drug. Uh, otherwise it doesn't help any. But then again, um, you can do, for example, pre-symptomatic uh, testing. And the uh, next slide actually shows the importance of this uh, point. Uh, this is a uh, family from Hungary. I was uh, lecturing in Budapest uh, of PXC a couple of years ago, and uh, there was came, one physician came and said, uh, she, he has a, a family where there's a 19-year-old um, uh, daughter who has BXC, has this kind of the typical uh, skin findings, has the eye problems, has a skin biopsy, which clearly confirms that there is a PXC in this uh, uh, calcification in this skin. And here is this 19 year old uh, uh, daughter. Parents are clinically normal, but then was the question. Here, this, uh, this uh, daughter has a younger brother who was uh, 13 years of age. Now, usually the a diagnosis is made about 13 years of age, but some are the older. So the question was, is he going to develop PXC later in life or not? So we can look into the mutations now. And here, this uh, just uh, quickly shows there are, there is a one mutation. Uh, so the parents are heterozygous carriers. They have one copy of their two ABC6 genes as a mutation. So they are plus minus and plus minus. And this daughter had inherited the mutation, the minus minus from uh, one of the parents each. So she had the disease. How about if we look to the DNA of the uh, younger brother? He is plus minus. So he's going to be exactly like the parents, and we predicted 2010 uh, that he's going to be uh, uh, healthy, not having the disease uh, exactly like the parents. And sure enough, as of today, 10 years, almost 10 years later, he has not developed any PXC. So we were actually uh, are able to tell in families where this previously affected uh, 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 PXC patient, we can now look into the younger or even older ones to see if they are at the risk of inheriting PXC. Now, we did originally uh, uh, this uh, mutation analysis kind of very a tedious, time-consuming way, um, uh, and uh, things have changed very rapidly. The technology for mutation detection uh, is uh, developing extremely fast. So instead of looking just one gene at the time, like the 
ABC6. We can now do a gene array, so we can actually measure 29 different genes um, in a, a kind of one test. And instead of doing one sample at the time, we can actually test 96 different samples uh, at the same time in this kind of uh, uh, facilitated platform. And then computer technology, bioinformatics, is able to pick up very quickly those uh, changes in the DNA uh, that are uh, pathogenic, in other words, are predicted to cause the disease. And then we can look genotype-phenotype correlation, in other words, look at the, uh, the mutations and how severe the disease is. So we actually, in collaboration with PX International, uh, just um, identified uh, DN, uh, mutations in DNA, and we tested over 400 families and did the sequence analysis by this accelerated way. You do programming, the computer tells the AB6 mutation is 55%, but then you hire a couple of graduate students or medical students who look into the computer individual and they find mutations in as many as 91.5% of all PXC patients you find ABCC6 mutations, so in a very uh, rapid way. And actually, this is we find the mutations in different uh, uh, patients uh, by allelics, the meaning the both uh, copies of ABCC6 had a mutation. But then we had, we didn't find any ABC6 mutation in about 8.5% of the cases. So we have to wonder if whether they really have PXC or are there other genes. But then we'd be working on this kind of uh, uh, notion of modifier genes. And there are, in addition to ABC6, um, I said there were 29, 28 other genes in our panel. So we looked into these other genes, whether these patients have, uh, who have AB6 mutations, do they also have uh, variants in the other uh, genes? And uh, we specifically focused on uh, um, four genes which have been previously shown to be associated with different forms of um, um, mineralization disorders. GGCX, ENPP179, ND5, and these are less common, but definitely cause PXE-like changes in the skin and in the vasculature. So we have been then looking if mutations in these genes could explain somehow the variability uh, uh, in the severity and the uh, age of onset. And actually this work is still sort of ongoing. Uh, and in order to make this study complete, we need families with DNA samples from family members who are affected with PXC and also who are normal um, uh, in appearance. Uh, so I uh, ask you all, if you are asked by PXC, international to donate the DNA samples. It's a saliva collection, very innocuous, and we can isolate the DNA and look for the uh, inheritance of these uh, rare genes uh, in together with BXC causing uh, genes. So these different genes give you a little bit different uh, very, uh, uh, phenotype, kind of variations. For example, if you have GGZX mutations, we are going to ask you, do you have any bleeding tendency? Is your skin more sagging than other family members uh, with PXC? In the ENPB1, do you have early vascular calcification like those GACI patients? And is the mineralization an early onset uh, uh, phenomenon? SAMD9 gives you mineralization in the skin at the site of trauma, so mostly at the elbows, knees, so we're going to ask you about those. And is there any evidence of inflammation, in other words, kind of redness of the skin at the areas where the mineral uh, uh, deposits uh, will uh, develop? And then there is this gene is associated with late onset vascular calcification, but also they get calcification in the periarticular areas in the knees and in the uh, uh, ankles and wrists. So we are going to ask these to see if these genes are somehow contributing to the uh, PXC uh, phenotype.
PXC genotype phenotype correlations. So there have been attempts previously to look into those. And we did together with PXC International uh, 2007, a study on two, 270 uh, international cases with PXC and looked the types of mutations and the types of uh, presentation of the disease and didn't really find uh, a difference. More recently, there was a Japanese study, 76 Japanese cases. They did not identify any significant genotype phenotype correlations. However, there was uh, more recently a French study, 458 cases across the France, and they found that certain types of mutations uh, predisposed the patients to more severe vascular and eye complications. So how about our study? Uh, where we had uh, almost 500 patients. And for our study, we found mutations in 401 uh, cases with uh, BXC. And then we looked into the severity of the disease, uh, taking advantage so of so-called Phenodex. And that Phenodex was developed by BXC International some uh, years ago to cage the severity, actually to quantitate the severity of the disease. So you look separately into skin, eyes, gastrointestinal findings, vascular uh, and cardiac findings. And you rank them from uh, like your skin, you can have no skin signs or you have more severe skin signs, S1, S2, S3. And then you sum up uh, this uh, number and gives you the Phenodex score. And that reflects the overall severity of the disease in th these patients. So we looked at our 400 patients where we found mutations and actually 280 of them had a complete phenodex. So the complete examination and they had the score. So we can now go to see different kinds of mutations. Do they correlate with the severity of the PXC? And uh, this is a little complex, but here we get the different colors show the different types of mutations. And the important here is this uh, loss of function mutations. They are mostly those uh, nonsense mutations. So you don't make the functional protein or complete protein. And if you look at these different kind of here, say eyes, this is vascular, uh, here is uh, gastrointestinal skin. The punchline here is that this red line here goes higher in eye, so the most severe eye findings are found in those patients who have this loss of function mutations in both alleles that that's uh, approaching um, uh, statistical significance. So those patients whom we know have this type of mutations are at risk of having more severe eye disease uh, than uh, those who have different kind of mutations. So that you can emphasize is the importance of knowing uh, the mutations in each patient. So our uh, panel, so as I just said, yeah, certain mutations are causing more severe eye involvement. Again, uh, get your mutations analyzed if you are a patient with PXC and haven't uh, done it yet. I showed the areas of research, and uh, I think the important here is that we are working on treatment on two levels. One is to prevent new mineralization. In other words, preventing the disease uh, getting worse. But then also, as I explained, it's important to try to reverse the existing mineral deposits. Uh, so because the patients uh, are diagnosed with uh, a disease they already has the uh, mineral deposit, so how can we get rid of it? And we have done a quite a lot of uh, work, uh, especially the prevention of mineralization. Next slide uh, will show that there are different ways. Um, most of these were work in our laboratory or other laboratories based on mouse models of uh, PXC and uh, Lily Lee is going to tell about the mouse uh, and animal models, how we can use them to uh, study uh, different treatments and develop new treatments. But we originally noted that if we just give mice, PXC mice who get tissue mineralization like the patients, same places, eye, skin, and the vasculature, if we give them high magnesium, increased levels of magnesium, they don't develop uh, 
mineralization. And uh, there was uh, recently a magnesium trial. Uh, patients were given magnesium and the study is uh, unpublished. They are still analyzing data, but there was suggestion that the magnesium may be helpful, but we need to see the actual uh, results. Uh, there is a sort of preliminary trial about inorganic pyrophosphate, giving that orally. That inorganic pyrophosphate is a molecule which is very low in PXC, and if it's low, it allows these mineral deposits to take place. So if we replace this um, uh, inorganic pyrophosphate by giving mouth, that might be helpful. Now, the problem pyro with pyrophosphate is that it has a very short half-life, so it, it disappears from the blood very quickly. But there are stable um, pyrophosphate analogs, so-called bisphosphonates. And they, there was actually, uh, we showed initially in mouse studies that bisphosphonates prevent mineralization. And there was a clinical trial which was done in the Netherlands, 70-some uh, patients, and they demonstrated that uh, giving patients bisphosphonates, uh, specifically something called etidronate, uh, that was uh, helping uh, or was preventing their vascular mineralization. And then there are new studies. There are companies interested in TNAP inhibitors, another way. This is enzyme which breaks down bisphos uh, pyrophosphate. So if you prevent the breakdown, the levels go up. And then we have more recently worked on gene therapy. In other words, put a, a new functional gene. Um, and very briefly, let me um, tell you about that uh, uh, study, uh, which has uh, uh, quite recently uh, accepted for publication. So, so basically, this is work by uh, John Huang and uh, Lily um, uh, with the uh, gene therapy experts here at Jefferson. Uh, basically, they use an adenoviral vector. This is basically a virus into which you can then uh, incorporate the ABC6 gene, normally ABC6 gene. So that is kind of piggybacking on the virus, which is able to uh, go to the um, uh, cells. And uh, we are hoping here that the cells then start making from this vector, uh, this ABC6 protein. And we have two versions. We have inactive form, which has no promoter. It's promoterless. And we have an active promoter. So this is supposed to uh, allow the synthesis of the APC6. And we have engineered uh, this um, vector so that there is a marker, this kind of uh, um, uh, greenish color. So if the G, uh, gene is active and the protein is made, we can look um, uh, by pores and color. We can, these are cells, um, and we put the vector, uh, if it's promoterless, in other words, control, there is no expression, but now we have the active form of the virus, and the more we put uh, the virus into the cells, more we get what this color, which means may more the ABC6 uh, protein. So this is in cell culture, in special cells. Where we can actually uh, 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 show that we can inject to mice, PXC mice, this vector, and their liver expresses this protein. Here is uh, the time-dependent manner, just one shot, and one week, two weeks, and four weeks, uh, and less so six and eight weeks, uh, we find uh, this protein present in the liver. And actually, this uh, just tells that it goes to the right place in the right tissue that is in the right cells in the liver. So we can do it in uh, 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 these um, mice. Uh, we can actually uh, uh, do histological analysis. So here are, this is the inactive vector. This is a specific calcification in specific structures in the skin. Uh, so these are the uh, untreated, basically untreated uh, mice. And here are two mice which are treated with this active vector and there is no mineralization here at all. We can actually quantitate by calcium assay. So this is wild type, normal mouse. There is no mineralization of very low calcium levels. Here is untreated mouse and here is a mouse treated with this inactive vector. 
so you get uh, uh, lots of mineralization like here. But then if we put the active vector, gene therapy vector, uh, the mineralization goes way down as uh, shown here in the, these and quantitated by calcium. So potentially we are able to prevent uh, the mineralization by putting an active gene uh, uh, to, to these mice and potentially with uh, further refinement and modifications go to the human uh, studies. So yeah, in conclusion, uh, so uh, this is just a proof of principle study at this point, uh, but we can uh, uh, find expression up to eight weeks. So you may have to go back and um, redo the um, application, um, uh, but uh, we can, we actually show that we can restore the inorganic pyrophosphate level. So that should prevent the mineralization in humans as well. One of the notion here was that the gene delivery failed to reduce the mineralization in old PXE mice. In other words, we cannot reverse by this way the mineralization, but we can certainly uh, prevent uh, a new mineralization and hopefully resulting in less mineralization overall. So uh, this is sort of a snapshot of what we are doing here at um, uh, PXE's International Center uh, of excellence uh, um, on research and clinical care. Here are these are some of the people. Just want to point out specifically uh, uh, Lily Lee uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, her group who've been working very hard on many of these projects. And we are very thankful to the uh, Sharon Terry and the, her colleagues at um, uh, PX International, Erin Oliphant, Elizabeth Terry, for collaboration. Then finally, uh, this was uh, our research group here at Jefferson uh, in 2000 at the early stages of uh, the BXC research. Uh, and then uh, uh, this is sort of more recent group here is uh, Lily and Kuhn de Wetteringer uh, who are working specifically uh, on PXC. I'd like to thank you all and if you have any questions, I'll be certainly happy to uh, uh, reply and give you answers. So thanks again to BX International uh, supporting our center here at Jefferson. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering, is uh, PXC considered a connective tissue disorder or a metabolic disorder? Because I've heard both. What was the first? I... Is it considered a... Uh, um, Connective tissue disorder or a metabolic disorder? Yeah, so, so originally it was called connective tissue disorder because um, in humans, the mineralization uh, actually, uh, it, they, it affects a connective tissue component, so-called elastic structures. And it was thought to be something wrong in that connective tissue. Now, since we showed that actually there's nothing wrong with the elastin, uh, or to that matter, uh, any other connective tissue component. It's not really a connective tissue disorder. That's a kind of older nomenclature, uh, older concept of PXE. But wh why we call it metabolic disorder, because the uh, deficiency is not, the gene defect is not where the pathology is. It's not in the eyes or in the skin. Those cells don't express the ABC6 gene but the AB6 gene is primarily expressed in the liver. And so the uh, deficiency in the liver causes this kind of metabolic pathway, which results in lowered inorganic pyrophosphate, and that allows the mineralization to take place in the, uh, in the uh, uh, peripheral tissue. So, so it's, it's really the most more correct uh, uh, version is to call it a metabolic disorder. Okay, thank you type of magnesium should uh, I be taking if you have uh, angioid streaks? Yeah, so, so that, that's a good question, uh, whether you should take magnesium at all, um, because we do not have the results yet, uh, definitive results from this study. And uh, I think PX International has taken the position uh, that uh, we should um, uh, analyze the data and uh, there is going to be a publication as I understand, uh, it's in preparation uh, and uh, hopefully will be published soon. So if there is uh, 
shown to be benefit uh, uh, of magnesium intake, then definitely uh, uh, it's warranted to take. Now, I, in my clinic where I see these patients, I do tell them uh, to double their magnesium and go to the, um, uh, one of the stores and get magnesium oxide tablets and uh, uh, try to uh, double. So the uh, uh, FDA uh, recommendation for normal magnesium in the United States population is 425 milligrams uh, per a day for a 75 kilogram uh, uh, person. So I tell them to double that. So uh, uh, about 900 milligrams uh, a day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. I also wanted to know, you were talking about the pyrophosphate. Now, uh, in order to lower, uh, uh, do, are you saying that I need to lower the pyrophosphate or increase the pyrophosphate? increase the pyrophosphate and it's important you make the distinction this is not phosphate but this is pyrophosphate yes. which is different molecule it, uh, actually it's been shown now quite recently within a two years two three years that uh, that it is uh, reduced in patients with pxc it's quite low you still have some uh, but uh, it's about 30% of the level in uh, unaffected uh, family members. And if you have low levels of pyrophosphate, then you get the mineralization. So the idea is to get increased the pyrophosphate levels. And uh, as I mentioned, there are some studies to try to see if we can give by mouth uh, pyrophosphate. Uh, but that's still at the very kind of early stages and uh, uh, needs to be worked out uh, before it goes to the clinical trials. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a question, please. Please. Um, thank you very much, it's been fascinating. Um, first question is, um, how can I access pyrophosphates? I spoke to my local doctor and she was unable to help me. Um, and secondly, how can I contribute um, a DNA sample? If yeah, okay, good questions. Uh, so first of all, as I said, the pyrophosphate, it's not a routine measurement, laboratory measurement. So you cannot go to the hospital and uh, say, uh, measure my pyrophosphate. Uh, it doesn't work that way. There are uh, uh, specialized laboratories like ours uh, or, uh, uh, or uh, in Hawaii uh, or uh, in Europe, uh, Dr. Barari's uh, laboratory, but that's really at the research level at this point. So uh, we do not recommend anybody to go and uh, try to get the pyrophosphate levels measured. Uh, the other point is that it's sort of variable, uh, it fluctuates, and there are suggestions that the pyrophosphate levels are dependent on what you eat, because pyrophosphates are, um, uh, it's a preservative and it's in many uh, foods, there is quite a lot of pyrophosphate. It turns out that, uh, for example, cheese, cheese has a quite a lot of pyrophosphate, but how much you eat to need, you need to eat cheese, that's not clear uh, at this point. So, so I wouldn't really, uh, yeah, and many of the physicians don't know actually of pyrophosphate story yet because uh, it's just emerging uh, from the research laboratories uh, and uh, definitely is not in the clinical trial level yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and, and um, about contributing DNA, are you still looking for something? Contributing DNA, yes, get in touch with the uh, PXC International. I, yeah. I'm in Australia, is that, an, is that an impediment? I'm sorry? I'm in Australia, is that an impediment? Hi, I'm, Sam here. You... Um, we can send you a... Um, a spit tube from PXC Fantastic. and then you would uh, fill that and then send it back to us. Um, I'll get your email from the registration, Anna, and I'll um, make sure that someone sends you one from our office. Could you send two because I might be able to get my sister con to contribute as well. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
And you Fantastic. should actually get the whole Australian PXE community together and uh, <laughs> send uh, uh, okay. some samples. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Very good. And most most importantly, you have to invite me to carry those tubes back. So. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome to come and take the sample personally and carry it back. Thank yeah. you so much. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I had another question. Please. Um, yeah, I have... I, I was diagnosed with PXC from a, a skin biopsy. Um, then my mother actually, um, she's in her 80s. She was, they just found android streaks in her eyes. But they did a skin biopsy and it was negative. So I was just wondering, is there, a, I mean, she also had a GI bleed. So is there a way that they could have missed it on her skin or could, could someone be negative in terms of skin biopsy and still have PXC? Yes, there there are cases who could be negative, but they, that's a very rare uh, event. Uh, most cases, most PXE patients definitely have uh, skin findings. In fact, that's in most cases the uh, first uh, first sign which uh, allows the diagnosis to be suspected, and then skin biopsy confirms uh, uh, the suspicion. Um, if you have PXE and the mother has PXE, that would be very unusual. Uh, there are, um, especially on the older individuals, um, there are skin changes, sort of age-associated skin changes, um, uh, photo damage um, uh, to the skin, which clinically mimics PXE, but it's not, they don't have PXE and they therefore don't have the mineralization in the skin biopsy as your mother does. Uh, as to the eye findings, uh, there are um, uh, uh, older people do get uh, uh, similar kind of changes as in PXE, macular degeneration, age-associated uh, findings. Uh, so if she has a little bit eye findings, that does not mean that she necessarily has PXE. Well, she, had, uh, she has android streaks. Yeah, that's that's uh, it depends how well they are diagnosed and uh, that sort of things. Do you have a way to find out whether she has PXE? Has your mutations been checked? No, I haven't. No. Yeah, so is to look for mutations in you and uh, her, uh, and uh, see uh, what's going on at the genetic level because PXE clearly is a genetic disease uh, with a essentially complete inheritance, uh, complete penetrance, so that those who have the two mutations, they all eventually develop PXE at some age. Okay, so that wouldn't be um, autosomal uh, dominant? Uh, there has been no uh, reported family with autosomal dominant PXE, and if you would be the first, we'll put you to uh, press. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would, I would uh, suspect your mother does not uh, have a PXC, but it, it can be checked. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Sounds like, uh, what time is it in Australia? Uh, it's about midday. Midday, <laughs> well, back to work now, I guess. <laughs> Something like that. So if nobody has any more questions, so uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. And uh, uh, if we can be of any further uh, assistance providing information or uh, give you um, clarification, so uh, get in touch uh, with us uh, through the PX International. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And good night. Good night. And good day. Good day. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good night. <laughs> Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.